Well, thank you for those rousing applause. My name is Keisha Hudson. I'm one of the co-executive directors of the Zahn Center, and I have the privilege of having a conversation with John Henry this evening. And just a quick note about John Henry. He, is, he was voted to Forbes 30 under 30 in Ebony's Power 100 list. John Henry is a Dominican-American entrepreneur and investor. Yeah! <laughs> Henry sold his first business by 21, is a partner at Harlem Capital, and is the host of Viceland's new show, Hustle, executive produced by Alicia Keys. Has anybody seen the show? Yeah. Got a few uh, that is awesome. So I'm going to turn the microphone over to John. That's incredible. I'll pose a few questions, but I know that you really want to hear him speak. Awesome. Wow. Thank you guys for watching the show. Damn. <laughs> Sometimes you never know who's watching, man. Um, and that's, that's kind of a special thing. The other day I was having a bad day and I f about what I forgot, which goes to tell you just how insignificant mm -hmm. it all is most of the time. And um, the two train opens up and as I look up, there's an ad for Hustle up there. <laughs> and I was like, hashtag perspective. I was like, all right, things is are it, all right. Is it surreal? Yeah, 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 yeah. It's definitely surreal. I think I came here fairly recently, um, and that was before we aired. Mm -hmm. And so I didn't know how the market was going to receive this product that we've been working on for so long. And I bet a lot of you maybe can relate. Um, I had spoken to some founders working on some cool things, and they just signed their first pilot, or you know, whether it's a music project or a school project. You never know how it's going to be received. And so ultimately, all you can do is put your, like, I feel good, and I would have felt good with no ratings if I kind of put my best foot forth and felt like I left it all on the table. Mm -hmm. um, and the fact that the market is responding and resonating, it's just icing on the cake. But that's a good, um, that, that leads me to a thought that I think is really relevant here, and that is this idea of resisting the temptation to have really big numbers when you start. And right now there's a disproportionate amount of attention and emphasis placed on large audience, crazy reach. You know, the first thing you look for is the blue check. Or if you launch a startup, you feel insecure if you don't have 100,000 users. Like there's always an emphasis I've noticed towards like numbers. But what I've found is if you can resist that temptation and focus more on resonance, on deep, deep resonance, you end up having a much better chance long term at bringing something meaningful to market. For instance, I don't measure my audience numbers, like how many flowers I have. What I measure are qualitative things. I measure how many people reach out in the DM with like multiple paragraphs worth of an anecdote about how they went through this thing, overcame it, and then they start, you know, I look for when someone shares and they, they'll add in, you know, some context around it that lets me know it was a powerful moment. That is what I pay attention to a lot more than the glory of big numbers. So anyway, I thought I'd set the tone with that, and you can take this discussion wherever you want it, but I thought that was really relevant to a lot of uh, you guys in the room because we're all kind of on the ground floor getting started. Well, let me follow up with that. But the question is, the way you're measuring it, is it the same way that the producers are measuring the show? Excellent question. And the answer is no. And the answer is that um, by far, most of the pressure will be there to you know, kind of succumb to this measurement system that I firmly believe is just vanity metrics. They're vanity metrics, they don't matter, and that's why it is a common pitfall. Because, you know, there's just, there's more sexiness, and then, it, and there's a lot of it is, is internal workplace politics. You're able to, it's much easier to champion to, some, to your higher up when you're like, hey, look, we have these numbers, these, and so forth. And so, sometimes there is a disconnect between what actually matters and what people think matters. And from what I've found in my perspective, my experience, my observation is um, there's a funny, there's a funny uh, kind of uh, truth where the most important 
Um, the most important kind of upside has a long tail. Mm -hmm. Very rarely do you see a spike immediately. Now, I'm experiencing a spike personally right now. I legitimately have an influx point, both in my career, in my audience, in my reach, in my infrastructure. Like, they happen. That shit is real. Like, I'm experiencing it for the first time. I used to be like, holy fuck, when am I gonna pop? Right, I've been doing this shit for a long time and now I'm having it, but it came from a long tail of, and all of a sudden the one talk that I did from years ago, uh, combined with a little piece of content, with the little meat, it all kind of comes together and then you have your spike. So let's talk about the long tail. Okay. Take us through the journey mm -hmm. from when you started mm -hmm. to getting now to Harlem Capital. Awesome. How many of you guys have contacts on my personal journey? Hands up. Okay, cool. So that's a lot of the room. So I'll spare the kind of the, the usual spiel, but look, the only thing that you guys need to know is that I am you guys, right? Like we are the same person, right? Like I, you know, a lot of us are first generation born immigrants or a lot of us, you know, grew up broke. A lot of us grew up below the poverty line. A lot of us grew up sometimes probably bitter at like, yo, how come I don't have as much opportunity as others? A lot of us grew up looking at Columbia University and being like, huh, I wonder what that's like you know, we have the same realities. And um, I had the great fortune of being called out on my shit early. Being called out by someone who was like, yo, what excuse do you got? Because I made it. And the moment you see someone who comes from where you come from that made it, all excuses go out the window. Until I hit that point, before I met my original mentor, and by the way, I'm now that for you guys. Like, for those of you guys sitting on your ass complaining, you have no fucking excuse now. Cause like, you know, we come from the same place. But before I came across someone that I could see that in, you know, I would see someone successful and be like, ah, well, and I would dig around for a reason why they were and I wasn't. And be like, um, you went to a four year school, boom, there you go. Well, Cause I dropped out of college, a lot of you guys know. Uh, or I'd be like, um, oh, well your parents own a house. Or man, but man, your mom, you know, didn't have to immigrate here, and, you know, and so on and so on and so forth. And then when you find that mentor who comes from where you come from and made it and they put you on, mm -hmm. up until that point, it's something else's fault. The moment that point occurs, it's your fault. If you really want it that bad and you don't make it happen, I want you to know that it's because you didn't dig deep enough and go and, and, and activate, you know, what you wanted. I hope that makes sense. Right? I hope it's not like me pointing at you guys and I, you know, I want there to be some perspective on that. But anyway, so yeah, I started the business, went, built it, sold it. Um, and I, by the way, I had to some color around that. Selling a business is not a big fucking deal, guys. Like the thing is that the tech publications make it sound like it's a big deal because in the tech industry, there is something that is very special to the tech industry and that is when you price a business, meaning when you determine the valuation of it, most industries have a very fixed valuation based on your revenue. In other words, if you're making $250,000 worth of revenue, most times you get a 4X multiple, meaning you take the 250,000, you multiply by four, and that's your valuation, a million bucks. In the tech industry, because it has the ability to scale exponentially, it's one of the only industries where you can take a $1 million revenue business and it's worth a hundred million. And because that, that um, elasticity in the valuation is so great, you know, there's a lot of like sexiness around the exit. But unless you're in the tech business, which by the way, I wasn't, and now I like to front like I was because I say it was an on-demand tech startup, that's just good fucking marketing, guys. That's just good marketing. Like I was in a dry cleaning business. I was cleaning people's, you know, dirty underwear. Like that's just what I did. Right, and so I got a modest valuation on my exit. But look what I've gone and done off of that. I've made more money after the exit than from the exit, right? And so I want you guys to really decouple from anything that is made to be sexy. Generally, is, is not worth going down that road. So back to earlier, big audience, resist that. Focus on resonance. Exit, resist that. Focus on revenue. Investors resist that focus on customers. You know what I'm saying? And like the more you lean into where other people aren't going, I think the better chance of um, success you'll have. When you first started out, your story, reading your story, it was you were working as a doorman. 
Yeah. And there was someone who gave you an opportunity. Yeah. Okay. Um, I saw that as could be identified as mentorship or sponsorship. Mm -hmm. Could you talk to how you saw that and what you see as the difference and the importance of the two? Yeah. One thing that I don't talk, it's a good question, mentorship or sponsorship. One thing that I don't talk about is this same gentleman that, that presented me with this opportunity also presented a lot of other doormen with the opportunity. And guess what? I went and visited my old mentor just last week. And the same colleague of mine who was also given the same opportunity to start a dry cleaner is still there behind the desk. He's still there behind the desk. Nothing wrong with that, but look what, in the same period of time, what the difference in the path can be if you make the most of it. And I'm not talking some Instagram bullshit, make the most of it. I'm not talking about just occasional Snapchat, you know, occasional snaps and you, you know, you post it up so it makes you feel better about it. I, and by the way, I'm not even glorifying this like hustle culture. I don't believe in over, over glorifying it. I just mean, if you guys are as sick as I was of growing up paycheck to fucking paycheck, like it takes that kind of intensity to break out of it. The next level up from paycheck to paycheck is like making 50 to 70 grand a year, let's say. In fact, I would argue we grew up below the poverty line, right? below poverty, which is third, less than 30,000. The jump from 30,000 to 70,000 is much greater than going from 70 to 200. And why do you say that? It's, it's, it, I, I, I want you guys to look this, this study up. Like, the whole study is like around can money buy happiness? And statistically, it can to a degree. Because the only people that say it can't haven't been broke as fuck before. Haven't been like with an empty fridge for days on end and mom and pop and like that stress looming over you. And studies seem to suggest that once you get to $70,000 a year, financial pressure greatly reduces. It's not that you know, money becomes not an issue, it's just that your quality of life improves, right? And so what I'm trying to do, by the way, is go from below poverty to fucking a billy with a B, right? And so I know, and I talk a big game, so if I'm talking a big game, I gotta work that big game. Right? So I wanted to make that distinction between over glorifying hustle culture for the sake of it and just being really clear about where I'm going because I'm mission driven. I want what I've discovered for all you guys. Specifically, you guys, not proverbial you, like this room I care a lot about. There's a reason I'm here right now, right? There's a reason. So how does mentorship and sponsorship play into that? Um, so that maybe not for you, yeah. but for others here. I, I, don't, I don't know those words, mentorship, sponsorship, what they mean to me is, guys, just find, I'm so big on just looking for someone whose blueprint you want to emulate. That's it. I don't listen to advice from anyone whose blueprint I don't want to emulate. And you have to silo that out, right? Like, I'm not gonna take relationship advice from a billionaire who's miserable, but I'm not gonna take money advice from my parents, right? And like when I was coming up, I had an exorbitant amount of pressure from my folks to follow a certain path that the more I learned, the more ridiculous it actually seemed. And so with any growth, there is incredible discomfort and more so when you come from our communities and the expectations of our families are placed on top. And the, the big mistake I see is people will give in to that pressure because they don't want to be the bad guy. You'd rather not be the bad guy and, and you, know, you go down a path that four to, four to six years later, then you figure out, all right, you know what, and then you start doing what you want, which by the way, you'd still be young as hell, but how cool is it that if you can, res if you can dig deep and resist that, you can get a head start. You can get a head start. Talking about family pressures and not wanting to be the bad guy. In the room here are a number of students who are in our program. Yep. Some who have gone through our program before. Some who are first gen. Some who are working several jobs to pay rent, pay tuition. Yep. Have uh, supporting their families. Totally. And trying to make that tough decision of which path to take. 
Right. right. Um, any advice to them? What, how, to, how to approach that? How to talk to your family about your dreams and aspirations and to get that support? That's a wonderful question. Um, guys, look, there is no doubt, no doubt that there are historical disadvantages that are disproportionate to our communities. None. I'm not going to sit here. As indefinitely optimistic as I am, I would, it would be a disservice to not acknowledge that they exist. Because I've been, we were just talking about this, I've been in rooms, legit, right, because I do this a lot now, I've been in rooms where on average, the majority of the people in the audience received 100 grand from their parents to go start their companies. Whole lot fucking easier, isn't it? If you had 100 Gs and you could just build some and you know, pilot it, and, and then here's the thing, if you fail, no problem, I know someone at Goldman. And if you succeed, great, we have a successful entrepreneur in the family. And if you need a bridge, we got you. Like, totally different reality. So I'm not gonna front like there aren't disadvantages, but I will not say that they're deterministic. And that is what I feel so fired up about. Meaning, it's not like if you got dealt a bad hand that you're fucked forever. Only if you buy it. Only, like, um, got you, a lot of you guys who follow me know I have a hip hop line for everything. <laughs> Kanye is like, I ain't played a hand I was dealt, I changed my cards. I prayed to the gods and I changed my stars, right? Like, and I remember listening to that in college dropout and I resonated with that. You ain't gotta play the hand you was dealt. Go change your cards, go do something. Do something, it can be done. It can be done. I can stand here with conviction and say I've walked maybe a different path than, than you know, someone else and it's not about like the specific path is about going out there and doing something different. You know what I'm saying? And I promise you, most people, most people, because they haven't experienced the, the amount of struggle that you guys have gone through, don't have that perseverance to, you know, to go through something meaningful. And, and so, and most people, by the way, just don't go on offense. Most people don't. I'm telling you, just by you going on offense, you will undoubtedly be 98% of most people, right? And, and that became really evident to me because at, for my high school years, I went to an upper middle class high school. They were fucking soft, soft. Like, like in that moment, I was bitter because they had all the cool shit, but like they can't go toe to toe with me. And they can't go toe to toe with you if you can nurture that animal instinct. But I want you to know that it's a muscle that you, that you flex and you hone. And right now I've caught my stride and I've hit my groove. And I, you know, I'm hitting a different tier now of my productivity, of my reach, of everything. But it only came as a result of starting, failing. Starting, failing. And I too went through those moments where I was like, damn, like, ah, man, it's not consistent. Like, I'm not, and, and you go through those enough times and, uh, and then, you know, you can break through to the other side. Okay, so let's talk about the low points and failure. What are some of the tools that you use to pick yourself back up, to keep yourself going? Um, when you are struggling with paying the rent versus buying supplies to get that shipment out? Totally. There have been times where I have been so frustrated so frustrated that I would cry a frustration and just yell, just fucking yell. And like that might not be the textbook way to deal with stress. Someone might say, yo, you need to see a therapist. And I might say, you know what, maybe you're right. But I've been through those points where I've been so frustrated because I feel like I'm rooted in, in something that if I am able to break through and the world at large could experience what I want to bring to the world, that the world would be net positively a better place. And when you have that kind of you know, stress and pressure on you, I think, I think going back to resisting what's sexy, I've long ago rejected this idea of like having really neat principles of how to deal with stress. You know, I've long since embraced that this art is ugly. It can be ugly. The art can be ugly. You show me a picture perfect little thing, and you know where they're selling that painting? In fucking Ikea for 20 bucks. Look at Warhol, look at Basquiat, like look at art. Art is not meant to be cookie cutter. So for all you guys writing these fucking blogs about how to cope with stress, you can sell your cookie cutter bullshit somewhere else. But for me, 
I'm perfectly comfortable embracing every aspect of the art. Because sometimes that blot that you throw up on the canvas ends up inspiring another idea. And when you take a step back before you know it, it's, you know, it's a beautiful, holistic expression of you. Um, and I didn't even mean to get poetic like that, but, um, but that's how I feel around it. I, I mean, it, and to, to sum it up in short, is just know that those moments are fine. Just know that you don't have to fake a happiness. You don't have to fake a motivation. You, you just have to be rooted in something deeper than the motivation so that when you're going through those low points, you can, you know, you can just withstand it because you, you know, it's like a wave. It comes and it goes. And once that wave of frustration leaves and I feel renewed in my purpose, I get right back to work. Let's switch gears a little bit. Let's talk about um, what's happening north of 96th Street. Let's talk about what's happening up in Harlem. What are you seeing? Um, yeah, I'm seeing some interesting stuff. Um, I do, I do uh, genuinely believe we've suffered some attrition, um, meaning like I've seen a spark of activity when I started, we met in 2015 when I first launched Co-Found Harlem. I, that was my first contact with the Zahn. Um, so I've seen several iterations kind of of the Harlem ecosystem. Back then it felt a little bit more buzzing. And even if you look at the restaurant row, like Marcus had to close down Street Bird, you know, there, we've suffered attrition. Um, but community development, economic development doesn't happen in a linear way. It takes several iterations. It takes, you know, certain things catching up, population growth, wage growth, employment growth. It takes, you know, more cohorts of these. It takes a lot of things. Um, but, but what I have seen though is, um, I've seen more and more people from uptown, downtown, which is telling of two things. One, that the, the quantity of individuals uptown that are interested in doing cool shit is growing, but that there needs to be more infrastructure uptown to house us uptown, which is why I've been thinking it's probably time to bring back the uptown tech meetup, to bring back uh, Co-Found Harlem. I, I did reiterate because we've been raising a fund it's really difficult to raise a fund um, you guys know we're pursuing a 25 million dollar fund we're at 15 million right now we're making our way um, and you know this is like the hero's journey we've stepped away you guys I'm perfectly aware but we're out there getting the money and when we come back it's gonna be with a lot more impact that we can have in the community so stay tuned talk about um, Harlem Capital and your partners and how the genesis of this idea came about and where you are. Yeah, um, that's a great question. Harlem Capital is interesting. It's, it's one of the f only companies that I've been involved with in my life that I didn't co-found. I started co-found Harlem. I was running that for three, four years and they hit me up and I had several touch points with them where I was like, hmm, I find these guys interesting. They started inviting me to their some of their potential deals, people were pitching them. What they were lacking, they were too stiff. They had the suit and the tie. I'm like, yo, that's not Harlem, all right? So I brought a little bit of energy. I brought their, their mission, their original mission was like to opportunist, opportunistically invest in companies and deliver returns for our investors. <laughs> and then when we sat down, I was like, er, scratch that. And I was like, how about change the face of entrepreneurship? by investing in a thousand diverse founders over 20 years. You know, sometimes you gotta bring a little bit of a vision and a movement piece to whatever you're doing. Same vehicle, we just, we just add a little something, we add a little Harlem to it, we add a little movement to it. Um, and they in, pitched me, they were raising a million bucks, they pitched me to invest. I said, I could write you a check for 25K, which isn't gonna move the needle, um, but what's more important than my Money is my time. And I don't put my time into anything unless I own. So I'd like to buy in as a partner. Mm -hmm. Now, an important note for everyone in the audience, the most, the most important consideration for anything that you do with respect to entrepreneurship is who you do it with. It's who you do it with. Now, if you don't have anyone to, to go and do your thing and you still feel so driven to do it, give it a shot. But just know that if you continually put yourself in environments like these, 
98% of people just get weeded out because, because people just aren't consistent. And then what happens is over time, you spot the real ones. And if you put two or three real ones together and are united in principle and with a similar vision, you guys can move mountains. And that's what I spotted in these guys. And instead of raising a million, we set out to raise 10. Instead of raising 10, we set out to raise 25. And um, guys, we've been in the rooms with Forbes top 10 wealthiest people in the world. Like we're talking about the people who move the most capital allocation in the world. How are four 20 something year old kids who've never done this before able to get there? As purpose, my friends. Like if we were trying to pitch them on how to make more money, they wouldn't be interested. They get all the money in the world. What they're interested in are seeing interesting people that they feel are, are driven by something greater. And that's how you win people's time. What is gonna be your investment strategy? My investment strategy is very clear. I'm looking at, I'm looking at my investment strategy, right? Like I can, so we, on, on average at Harlem Capital, we see about 500 deals a year. And I can say this, right? Statistically, our companies that are founded by minorities and women compared to white male counterparts, when they're making the same revenue, women and minorities will consistently undervalue their companies, right? We call that white boy confidence um, because 98% of capital across all the time has gone historically to white males and th there's just societal things we can all acknowledge, whether white or black, um, um, where you, know, you step into a room with a certain expectation that something can happen, maybe even subconsciously programmed. And, and you know, my partners and I joke like, all right, let's, let, let's drum up that white boy comment because it's, it's very helpful sometimes. Because, so, so stepping back for a moment, again, toe to toe, we look at a company making a million that's founded by a woman versus a million that's founded by a white male. On average, the white male at, at a million dollars will, will have an eight to $10 million valuation Women will consistently go for between four to five million, almost half. Now, that's, that's interesting because that speaks to our subconscious kind of, you know, indoctrination, if you will, to like our, we're like, you know, we shrink. We have a tendency to shrink than, than rather to expand, right? But now we feel that this is a, a phenomenal business case because we know that you guys are just as valuable as anyone else. And so we'd rather invest in you guys, you know, at modest valuations and nurture your growth and then funnel you up so that by the time you raise your series A, your series B, whoop, you get a pop. Now, and who, ex who participates in that pop? The guys who took the risk early. And who are gonna take the risk early? People who understand what it is that you're looking to build. Like if you walked up to, you know, Union Square Ventures with your idea, Trailo, He's, he's creating a, a logistics network around bodegas and supermarkets because his family um, owns um, those kinds of businesses. Like Fred Wilson would be like, huh? <laughs> He'd be like, what? And I, I don't think it's, it's like, I don't think it's ill-intentioned. It's just that people do what they know. People do what they know. I'd rather give all these people the benefit of the doubt. But what do I know? I know uptown, I, you know, I know our community, so we can spot those opportunities a little bit better, write them checks and make money together. So talking about you know, under, uh, undervaluating, undervaluing your company, trying to negotiate these deals for first time entrepreneurs, right? Haven't gone that route yet, down that path. Yeah. What, what tips can you give them in preparing for that? What should they start looking for, start thinking about? Yeah. How to position themselves. Yeah. Um, I, my answer is twofold on this. One, um, you know, I don't know how many of you actually want to set out to build venture companies. It's a very difficult thing. Um, and again, it's made to seem sexy so people go down the path. Um, in fact, one of our companies that went through our incubator, um, local Terran, this is some years ago, you know, in the middle of it, uh, you know, they didn't finish the program. And frankly, a false sense of what it's like to grow a business because they're coming up in this, you know, 
peer supported environment and it's all like, yo, you got this. And then, you know, they entered the market and it was like, oh fuck, like it's really, really hard. And I, pro you know, I give them props for recognizing that early and they made the conscious decision to be like, all right, this is not for me right now. Let me take a step back. And that would be my greatest wish um, is that you guys don't have this pressure to ride something through to the end if it doesn't feel right. Like that's just your intuition speaking. But then, so weeding that, that segment of the room for the segment of the room that is firmly convinced that they really want to give this a shot, then, you know, it's, come, please come speak to me. Come speak to me, um, even separately from this. I'll, I'll offer some feedback. I, I guess my feedback would be, again, the most important consideration is who you do it with. Um, sometimes the ideas that come easiest are the wackest ones, honestly. If you thought about it really easy, there's prob that's what I call a me too idea. Like, oh, me too, I could do that. You know, so, so sp spend more time with whom you think you'll do it with than trying to come up with like a brilliant idea because I think you'll get a better end result when you spend time with quality people and give it time and eventually you spot what you want to dig into. Ready for some questions? Yeah, let's do it. Okay, we're gonna open it up for some questions for John. Anyone have a question? Yes. All right, I have a couple questions, but I was gonna be um, In terms of you were talking about the Harlem ecosystem, or like the economical, I guess, iterations that you've seen. Yeah. Yep. It's like, there's this whole idea of like, there's so much more business around, but it's like, that money's not good, that money's not good for your neighborhood. Like, 125th is like, all these chain stuff, and it's like, a lot of mom and pops close down, and they have a lot of chains and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. So I guess like, how do you think that we're gonna kind of, like our, our generation, or like our, our like, our community can combat that, you know? Understood, yeah. That is the question. Um, yeah, yeah, the question is, hey, pretty much how do we buy back the black? Um, and that is a guiding principle of mine. And that is something that was at the seed. This has been, man, sometimes our legacy projects, we don't even realize when the seed is planted from when we're young. But even when I was doorman, the, the seed that attracted me to getting started in, in starting a business was that I was reclaiming kind of my value. I had an opportunity to find my own value. And then when I look at co-found, there was that seed of like, man, let's build up our own equity. Harlem Capital, same thing. And the answer is I've been, it's been a year, like eight year long pursuit of that answer. And the more and more I rise in terms of like the rooms that I have access to, Right, like one of our lead investors, whom you, you guys will see the full Harlem Capital team pitch a billionaire on Hustle, episode seven. By the way, what fucking show is gonna offer you that access? What show shows you the meeting where you pitch the big money? Tell me, I wanna know, right? So, it's, so, so this gentleman owns a lot of real estate in Harlem. Right? They, own, they control $7 billion of real estate, a lot of it in Harlem, a lot of it in affordable housing, that's his bread and butter. And you start to understand that the answer, you need economic empowerment and mobility. Like everyone's gonna tackle their own little piece of it, but to your specific question, like how do you buy back the block? You literally need funds and mass because it's one thing to have a, a disproportionately loud voice in the community board meeting, like that's fine. But I'm telling you because I'm in the rooms with these cats, like ultimately when you write the check and you claim the property and you own it and you can insure, you can control who leases, who releases, who sublets, you know, and, and also the city plays an important role because they, you know, they can, they can put up you know, regulations around, you know, what percentage of housing is affordable, but then the question is affordable for who? I don't know if you guys have seen the affordable housing that's up for stock, but it's, it's expensive, 
Affordable for who? Right? And so my like long-term thing is I want to buy back the block. Like I want to raise a mega billion dollar fund where we can buy back all this real estate and release. I ain't going to give it away because you got to make your payments, but I'm going to release it at low interest rate, right? Because I want people to understand ownership. And so it's, it's top down. And the last thing I'll say about it is we are affected by this more than other communities because we don't control any of the capital allocation. This is something that's not talked about in schools. It's not even talked about on the fucking blogs. It's not talked about on Fortune. On purpose. On, on purpose or not, it's because it's not a sexy issue. You do hear a lot about diversity and inclusion in terms of like, yo, founders don't get a lot of money. We're not getting a lot of money because we don't control a lot of money. The fact that the biggest, like we're gonna be one of the biggest diversity focused funds, $25 million, that's nothing. It's nothing, nothing. We're gonna be one of the biggest ones. When we set out to raise 25, we got people asking us, yo, you sure you don't wanna raise 10? When someone from Silicon Valley goes to raise out 25, people say, yo, you sure you don't wanna raise 50? I'm telling you, people don't believe in this as a business case. And I can't wait when I look back at this fucking vlog 10 years from now, when we've raised a billion dollars of, of capital over five funds and I can say, I told you so. There's a business case here. Hi. Uh, when you first started as an entrepreneur, you had, to go across, you had to come across some brick walls, some hurdles. Can you, can you explain a little bit about what that might have been when you first started, what type of brick wall it was and how you get over, uh, over that hurdle? Yeah, the, the biggest hurdle up front always is that we in this room will disproportionately have a, a short-term cash pressure more than most, right? Like when I left my job, it wasn't, okay, I have a cushion that I can, you know, it was, I left my job, I gotta produce revenue right now. And that oftentimes can adversely affect your ability to create a good product. Like imagine if Facebook had to monetize immediately. They wouldn't exist. They had the space, they had the space to be able to develop product, you know, to um, figure out their product market fit. And then much later, they were about monetization. And so as a result, I do think that we are better positioned to succeed um, in the short term if we're in businesses that can generate revenue. And that's why I, I kind of like this idea of like the whole dry cleaning thing. I could just hustle, man. I could just hustle. And you know, a few orders at a time, boom, I was, you know, so that was my biggest pressure early on was meeting those cash pressures. Now, after my first go around, and guys, it takes several times, like Adam Newman, the founder of WeWork, this is fifth business. People just see WeWork. His fourth business was another co-working space called Green Desk. And he was like, yo, people don't give a shit about eco-friendly space. That's what he thought the big problem was. And then he spotted another one, it's community. And so I say all that to say, now I'm on my third go around. Now I just know way more. I know way more people. There's no room that I walk into in the New York City tech ecosystem that doesn't at least know what I'm about, right? And so if you're on your first go around, just know it might take one, it might take two, it might take three. There's, there's levels to it, you know what I mean? So, you know, that, that was my first challenge, was the cash. We have time for one more question. Yes. <clears throat> um, we have, at least in the Latino community, we have a lot of athletes and artists who are looking to diversify their portfolio and investment. Yes. Um, how do we get and create a better pipeline between them to showcase how other communities are investing in startup founders, right? And uh, and also, you know, plant the seed because in our in our community, it's like, oh, you're loaning someone money, you're not investing into the, you know, into the into the company per se. So how do we create a better pipeline showing examples of, for example, Harlem Capital, where we can get, you know, you got Manny Machado just signed a $300 million deal, right? And then you got athletes like Jose Reyes who just retired. How do they continue their legacy and, and help uh, founders like us? That's a great question. Um, I've sat down with a lot of athletes, you know, and it is really unfortunate how athletes get gamed a lot you know, because it takes a lot to be able to perform at those levels physically. And so they just don't even have time oftentimes to nurture their financial savvy. One of our investors is, uh, is on, the, on the Jets, Kelvin Beecham, he's an offensive lineman. Um, and it just takes, it takes 
um, more clarity and understanding around how this all works. I am not a big fan of telling someone who's got a little bit of bread to start investing in startups because this is some high risk shit. I sat down with P. Diddy's CFO um, a couple of weeks. We just were on a call um, this week, but we met maybe a year ago now. And he told me something interesting. He said, yo, when Puff, when Puff builds a company, this is his CFO, by the way. So when Puff builds a company from scratch, his returns are through the roof because that's what he's set up to do really well. He's got that marketing, he, you know, he's got that charisma. Ciroc, his returns are ridiculous. But when he makes an outside investment, so when he, when he writes a check to another founder, his, he typically does not do well because he's not set up to do well. And so I've learned at this point that you can't just write checks and be like, oh, I'm writing checks for writing checks sake. I see them do it. I see them get into really bad businesses. Restaurants, not a great business, guys. Not a great fucking business. Like, that's really, like your financial advisor was like, come on, man, come on, dog. Like, yeah, there's a lot of things popping off right now. Media, cannabis, but you can't just be high flying throwing startups out. So I do believe that you have to create the vehicle and get set up to do well. Like Harlem Capital, as an example, you know, we, the reason funds do well is because the numbers work against you until they work for you. It's the law of averages, right? So if you make one bet, as an example, if I invest in your company, I'm highly likely to lose my money. If I invest in a hundred people's companies, you know, eventually you balance out. And so to the athletes, man, get rooted in the vehicle is more about the vehicle. Like, and now that I've learned that, I'm building a vehicle in every part of my life. Now in real estate, like I'm building a vehicle in real estate. Right now I own $2 million worth of real estate. I'm shooting for $100 million. It's just the start. Harlem Capital, 25. In media, same thing. It's all about the vehicle, right? It's not little one-off attempts. It's understanding enough about the landscape and creating a vehicle, right? Like production companies and TV make a lot of fucking money because they own those shows. And by the way, there's a rerun of my show on air right now. I'm here on this panel. Like I'm getting 250,000 people every time we're on air watching me. And then watch me again, and then watch me again, and again, and again. It's not about me, it's just that look at the way that that machinery works. You create, you put all the work into one asset and you distribute it and then it just compound benefits continually over time. So athletes, the more they understand that in media and real estate and venture, the much better off they'll be. And also, if that piqued your guys' interest, I really hope you would reach out to me on that because that is the game, is figuring out the vehicle, how it works, and choosing which one you want to build. Thank you, John. Thank you, guys. Time to network. Refreshments. <laughs> Drake. Uh, hustle comes on. Uh, yeah, uh, Hustle is on Sundays at 9 on Viceland. Um, it would mean the world to me if you guys watched. That's literally my only ask right now. Please watch the show. It means a lot. Thanks.